So this is line 13. No. <laughs> it's part 122, line 18, A3S. Linear frame dragging, black hole rotating, UFO, LARES, L-A-R-E-S, stands for a satellite. Minkowski, wormholes, while SETI. Okay. Again, we Google this number here, and this all this data comes up. Here's a black hole rotational frame dragging. That's what it looks like. So the arm extended toward the black hole will be torqued spinward. The arm extended away from the black hole will be torqued anti-spinward. She will therefore be rot rotationally sped up in the counter-rotating sense to the black hole. If she is already rotating at some speed when she extends her arms, inertial effects and frame dragging effects will balance and her spin will not change. Another interesting consequence is that for an object constrained in an equatorial orbit, but not in free fall, it weighs more if orbiting anti-spinward and less if orbiting spinward. Again, this is in relation to the UFO uh, rotating. It's saying that it's going to weigh more if it spins a certain direction. Similarly, a stationary plug bob suspended over the rotating object will not list. It will hang vertically. If it starts to fall, induction will push it into the spinward direction. Linear frame dragging is the similarly inevitable result of the general principle of relativity applied to linear momentum. Although it is arguably has equal theoretically legitimacy to the rotational effect, the difficulty of obtaining an experimental verification of the effect means that it receives much less discussion and is often omitted from articles on frame dragging. See, see Einstein 1921. Static mass increase is a third effect noted by Einstein in the same paper. The effect is an increase in inertia of a body when other masses are placed nearby. While not strictly a frame dragging effect, the term frame dragging is not used by Einstein. It is demonstrated by Einstein that it derives from the same equation of general relativity. Kepler and orbital elements are more affected by the non-gravitational perturbations like the direct solar radiation pressure, the use of the active drag-free technology would be required. Recently, an indirect test of the gravitomagnetic interaction accurate to 0.1% has been reported by Murphy et al. with the lunar laser ranging LLR technique. But Copenhagen questioned the ability of LLR to be sensitive to gravitomagnetism. The gravity probe B that has come up before in the data, just so you know, experiment was a satellite-based mission by a Stanford group and NASA used to experimentally measure another gravitomagnetic effect, the shift precession of a gyroscope, to an expected 1% accuracy or better. Unfortunately, such accuracy was not achieved. The first preliminary results released in April 2000 point towards an accuracy of 256 minus 128% with the hope of reaching about 13% in December 2007. In 2008, the Senior Review Report of the NASA Astrophysics Division Operating Mission stated that it was unlikely that Gravity Probe B team will be able to reduce the errors to the level necessary to produce a convincing test of currently untested aspects of general relativity, including frame drain. Recently, the Italian Space Agency, ASI, has announced that the LARES satellite should be launched with the Vega rocket at the beginning of 2012. The goal of LARES is to measure the lens stirring effect to 1%, but there are doubts that this can be achieved, mainly due to the relativity low orbit which LARES should be inserted into bringing into play more mismodeled even zonal harmonics, that is spherical harmonics, of the Earth's gravitational field caused by mass concentrations like mountains can drag a satellite in a way which may be difficult to distinguish from frame dragging. In the case of stars orbiting close to a spinning supermassive black hole, frame dragging could, should cause the star's orbital plane to process about the black hole spin axis. This effect should be detectable within the next few years via astrometric monitoring of stars at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. By comparing the rate of orbital precession of two stars on different orbits, it is possible to, in principle to test the no-hair theorems 
of general relativity in addition to measuring the spin of the black hole. And there's a diagram there with some sort of mathematical equation. Give you a rough idea what they're talking about. February 13th. This caught my eye because it's taking, it's talking about rotation and propulsion for our spacecraft. Then it goes into results from previous testing from the gravity probe B, which was mentioned in another line of data. Looking for accuracy, a new test is scheduled for 2012. In the last line of data, we were looking at creating anti-gravity so that the ship can proceed quickly at a high rate of speed without having to deal with frame dragging. The LRES satellite from the Italian Space Agency is conducting tests to measure the lens slurring effect. I'm going to look it up to see what it means. And this came up, Nonlinear Gravitodynamics Lens Slurring Effect, a documentary from Remo Ruffini and Costantino Sigmundo Mondi. This book gives a detailed, up-to-date account, it was published in 2003, of the lens slurring effect and its implications for physics and astrophysics. Starting from a profound intuition of lens slurring in 1918, based on a simple solution to the linearized Einstein field equations, this has emerged in the past four decades as a phenomena of extraordinary importance in cosmology, radio jets and quasars, and the physics of neutron stars and black holes, besides leading to some of the most sophisticated experiments ever performed in space surrounding our planet. The book contains the contributions presented at the third William Fairbank meeting, which have been expanded by adding a complete set of classical and prominent contemporary papers on the subject and a general introduction by R. Ruffini. So next I googled NASA Astrophysics Division Operation Missions. I want to know what it was. It's held every two years. The Operating Mission Senior Review evaluates proposals from operating missions for continued funding. So basically they decide who gets money and who doesn't. The Astrophysics Division uses the Senior Review to maximize scientific productivity of operating missions and that have completed prime operations. There's a total of nine projects have been invited to participate in the Astrophysics 2012 Senior Review to be held on February 28th and to March 2nd, 2012. That's going to come up in two weeks. The Chandra, Fermi, Hubble, Kepler, Planck, Swift, Suzaku, Spitzer, and XMM Newton. I should look those up and see what they are. <laughs> then we have a patent number coming up here. Always got to look at those. They're always important. It's patent US number 2006007376. Method of gravity distortion. A method to take advantage of the lens throwing effect to stimulate the effect. The effect of two point masses on nearly radial orbits. So application number, everything there is from Marlon B. Pullman. And he's a method of gravity distortion and time displacement. He mentions the care black hole, so I got a photo of it to see what it was. So a method for employing sinusoidal oscillations. Again, those two words have come up before. Of electrical bombardment on the surface of one care type singularity in close proximi proximity to a second care type singularity and such a method to take advantage of the lens throwing effect to stimulate the effect of two point masses on nearly Radial orbits in a 2 plus 1 dimensional anti de Sitter space resulting in creation of circular time-like geodisks conforming to the Van Stockham under the Van de Broek modification of the Alcubierre geometry. Van de Broek 1999 permitting topology change from one space-like boundary to the other in accordance with Georex theorem. Georock 1967, which results in a method for the formation of the Goulomet over Odell type geodistically complete space time envelopes complete with closed time like curves. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? So he claims a method for the generation of a pseudo 2 plus 1 dimensional anti de Sitter space comprising the steps up. Creating two care type positively charged rotating dilation singularities, including the steps of maintaining. Okay, we went through that already. The second one was a method of generating a force around a body. 
This is what we're trying to do, something that rotates. He talks about the axis of rotation. So comprising the steps of employing sinusoidal oscillations of electrical bombardment on the surface of one care type reference singularity in close proximity to a second care type. So you have the rotating UFO and then you have the little thing in the middle and they're in close proximity so I thought you could use this. Okay, That's why I brought it up. So where the electrical currents employed in the bombardment are passed simultaneously across the photosphere of said reference singularity in its direction of rotation and contrary to its direction of rotation to release a directive flow of gravitons in a sinusoidal I don't know what he's talking about but anyways that's what he's talking about here are some pictures that I uh, photoed with my Google photo thingy so that's what it looks like again this reminds me see I wrote here looking at the diagram above reminds me of my sketch of the UFO engine we desire to build Rotating body on the outside and a core circle in the middle that floats on the inside. Could it be that this is the technology required to make such a thing? And here's some more pictures from him. Next comes up this here. I don't know what the ID number is for it, but those are the code numbers there. How computers can help us in creating an intuitive access to relativity. Hans Ruder, Daniel Westkopf. Hans Peter Nollert and Thomas Muller. Theoretical Astrophysics. Okay. 2008. Abstract computers have added many new possibilities to the toolbox used for visualizing science in general and relativity in particular. We present some new results from our own work. 2 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski diagrams showing two spatial dimensions, extended wormhole visualization, and the illustration of accretion disks by using the approximation via a rigidly rotating disk of dust. We also discussed some related examples from our earlier work such as interactive and immersive visualization or the visualization of the warp drive metric. There's all the things they talk about. Theory, wormholes, wormholes, warp drive bubbles, Sounds cool. Grab some pictures from their site. So this is a multiple and coordinated views of different visualization paradigms of the same scene. 3D rendering of the static spatial scene. Egocentric view from the fast moving camera. The respective 2 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski diagram. So this is what their program can do. And I need a drink. I have no idea what this is. Doppler effect resulting from motion at a velocity of 95% of the speed of light. Now that's what I like. We're trying to get faster than the speed of light, right? I don't know if how, well, I do know how fast the speed of light is, but I'm trying to do 5G force. I'm trying to find the calculations to do that. And there's a searchlight effect at the same velocity. Cool what they do. Here's another little thing they did. This is the null geodisks in the Morris Thorne wormhole space time. Light rays separated by that equation, where zero denotes the radial direction, and the observer's frame may originate from the same side or from the other side of the wormhole. There you go. This thing here starts there, changes there. Okay. So this shows a hypothetical machine. So I see hypothetical, I think, oh good, this is a theory. We got another theory to work with, right? Hypothetical machine creating a non-rotating Morris Thorne wormhole and another one for a rotating wormhole. A rotating wormhole may contain an ergogonian, or whatever you call it, er, ergo, I'm not even try. <laughs> ergo region, how's that? Even more interesting for someone passing through may be the fact that the exotic matter, which is necessary for stabilizing any transverbal wormhole, need not be distributed evenly around the throat as it has to be for a non-rotating wormhole. Therefore, there may be a trajectory through the wormhole which do not touch exotic matter. <clears throat> yeah, okay, you guys figure that one out. 
The null geo disks are computed for the Schwarzschild. Ah, there's Schwarzschild again. See? He comes up. I like this thing. That looks like a UFO to me. See that? Actually, it's a diagram. <laughs> Visualization of an accretion disk around a black hole. Colors correspond to the temperature on the surface of the disk. I just think that's the prettiest thing. The hydrodynamics equations are solved using an SPH code in a Newtonian space-time. The differences from a fully relativistic simulation are probably small enough to be hardly visible in a picture like this. This image was reprinted by Nollard A at AL10. And it's iposcience.iop.org. That's their website. The hydrodynamical SPH simulation has been performed in a completely non-relativistic environment using a Newtonian gravitational field for the dynamics of the disk. Self-gravitation of the disk is ne neglected completely. The major problem in doing a relativistic simulation is not that the hydrodynamics equations become more complicated on a relativistic background, but rather the fact that no clear definition of viscosity exists. Isn't that pretty? Let's show how it does. So this is an abstract visualization of the rotating disk of the dust with a varying value of u equals that, 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 and that. Okay? Again, same website. And acknowledgments. Okay, we thank Roland Spice for providing the data for this surface image of an accreditation disk around a black hole. Mark Borchers provided figures 5 and 7 9. Heinrich H. Wolsov of the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Tubigen granted permission to use their 3D model of the old city of Tubigen. In generating these figures, Oliver Fetchett created the images for figure 18. These are all the tags for this. I don't feel like saying them. I'm tired. Sorry, but there's this, oh, these are all going to be the tags that go with this when I post it to the blog, right? I always take out the keywords, put them in the blog post so you know what's on there. So that's the end of that video, and now we can go on to the next one.